We live in a nation where there's a 50% divorce rate. Actually, it's higher in the church, according to George Barna. 40% of our children are born out of wedlock. 3,000 of our babies are aborted daily. 3,000 daily. We have 19 million new cases of sexually transmitted diseases every year. Our high schools are teaching moral relativity and evolution. Homosexual marriage is becoming accepted. It's being legalized across the nation. This land needs revival. I said this land needs revival. But guess what God said? He said, if my people... Did you hear that? If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, seek my face, pray, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. But only then will he hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our land. If we want our land healed, there's some stuff we have to do as the people called by his name. If we want our land revived, there's something we have to do to be revived first. It starts in the church. Judgment starts in the house of the Lord. Revival starts in the house of the Lord. What is revival? I'm going to tell you what Charles Finney said. Who has heard of Charles Finney? A great revivalist. So I, you know, if I wanted to learn how to make money, I would go to somebody who's a millionaire. <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? So I'm going to ask Charles Finney what revival is. And here's what he says. Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. For those of you who are here in the church, I believe I put that in your bulletin. It's just a great quote. Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. So three important things. Conviction, desire, and obedience. Revival isn't just going to fall from the sky. A lot of people are just waiting around. Oh, I'm not doing much, but it's going to happen to me. No, there's something the church has to do. Number one, we have to ask for revival. Zechariah 10.1 says, Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Are you asking? Isaiah 62.7 says, Give him no rest, no rest, until he establishes us and makes us a praise in the earth. Are you giving him rest? Don't. Don't give him any rest. Keep asking and pleading for the end time revival. And it will come. It will come. Okay, so we have to ask. Secondarily, we have to prepare. Prepare the way. I heard this said once. We cannot organize revival, but we can set our sails to catch the next wind from heaven. That's why I have entitled this message, Set Your Sails. We have to learn how to set our sails. And I believe a great biblical account of setting their sails for revival was in Nehemiah chapter 8. So let's turn there, Nehemiah chapter 8. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that the things that happened to Israel, the things that happened to the people of God in the Old Testament was a type, a shadow. And it was written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we should expect that the things that happen to them should happen to the church more comprehensively and in a spiritual manner. So let's look at Nehemiah 8. I'll give you a little historical background of Nehemiah 8. Israel was disobedient. Therefore, after disobedience and disobedience and disobedience, God finally said, that's enough. You're going into captivity into Babylon. So the Babylonians came. They besieged Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They ravaged the city. They took the people to Babylon for 70 years. But God had promised he would lead the exiles out. So after 70 years, he raised up a man named Cyrus of the empire of Persia. The Persians came in and they conquered the Babylonians. You got it? You with me so far? All right, here's what happened next. Now, the Persians allowed the exiles to leave in three waves. Say three waves. Three waves. All right, first wave was under the leadership of a guy named Zerubbabel in about 536 B.C. The second wave was under a man named Ezra the scribe. And then the third wave was under Nehemiah. And that's what we're reading today. Nehemiah 8 concerns the exiles who left 
under the leadership of Nehemiah and some of the accomplishments they did in Jerusalem after that wave went back to Jerusalem. So, who is Nehemiah? Nehemiah was the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes was one of the uh, successors to Cyrus of Persia. So he was the king of Persia. Now, what is a cupbearer? Has anybody heard of a cupbearer? A cupbearer is the guy who would taste the food and drink before the king would eat or drink it. So the cool thing about it is your job is to eat. Who likes to eat? I do like to eat, but here's kind of the downside. <laughs> the downside is if somebody tried to poison the king, the cupbearer gets to eat or drink that food first, and he drops over dead. So the king doesn't drop over dead. That's the downside. So I wouldn't jump on monster.com and be looking for any cupbearer jobs anyhow, for today. Because a cupbearer was a high-ranking official because they were in the presence of a the king. They rubbed shoulders with the king all day. So Nehemiah was in the presence of the king one day. He, uh, Nehemiah had just heard about the state of Jerusalem. Now, I told you there were three waves. Two waves of exiles had already gone back to Jerusalem, and they were rebuilding the temple and so on and so forth. But they had not rebuilt the walls and the gates around the city yet. So they weren't safe yet, and they were still suffering persecution from the Samaritans. So Nehemiah heard about this, and he was upset. He was mourning, actually. Cried out to God, God, what should I do? I need to go help them. So he went into the presence of Artaxerxes, and he asked him if he could go back, take some people, and get some formal papers, allowing him to go back and lead this initiative of rebuilding the walls and gates around this city. You know, walls and gates speak of salvation and praise. Salvation and praise. So he, he led these people back, and this is what Nehemiah 8 is about. Uh, at the end of Nehemiah 6, they had finished the walls, and at the end of chapter 7 in Nehemiah, they kind of organized the city. You know, the civil, they take the population, they register the people, and kind of set everything up in a civil manner. But Nehemiah 8 is where they have to take care of the spiritual climate of the city. They need to bring revival. They need to catch that next wave from God. So they set their sails. So look, let's look at verse 1 here in Nehemiah 8. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. First thing I want to tell you was right about this, was the leadership was right.